I know we've done a lot of research on their supply chain. Walk us through, you know, what kind of their factory base looks like, who was actually, you know, manufacturing a uh, hundred thousand sunglasses in a week. I mean, who, who could pull that off for them? Yeah. So they're, they're sourcing exclusively from China. Um, and it, it, their sourcing strategy seems a little bit interesting where they're, <clears throat> they're rotating back and forth from different providers. It seems that they will play them off of one another. I'm, I'm going to let you pronounce these names because you'll, you'll pronounce them correctly. Um, but going back, they, it, it's interesting to see how in 2015, 2016, they would have maybe one or two shipments a year. And now they're doing one or two shipments a quarter. And this just gives you a, a sense of, of where they are. And um, I can't remember, we, we mentioned this, but they were $40 million when they were acquired in 2019. In 2021, so two years in, uh, they were $85 million. I can only imagine what they are um, now. So probably over 100, I would imagine, just with the Dion deal. Um, but uh, certainly growing pretty quickly. Oh, it's incredible. And I mean, for those that want to know their factory base, you know, we did some research in terms of, you know, looking up their import records and trying to understand their factory base. So it looks like they work with four main suppliers, um, Taijo Cremillo Glasses, starting in April 2022, Wenzhou Success Group, starting in January 2023, Direct Vision Supply, starting in April 22, and Xiaomen You Best Eyewear which looks like they transition quite a bit of volume to, to the supplier. So, I mean, it's, it's incredible to have that factory base. You know, obviously they are not single sourced, which is super important for a brand like this, especially when they're, you know, growing like crazy through a partnership with Coach Prime. I, I'm curious, I mean, when they're placing that, that order for that partnership with Coach Prime, do you think they're placing it at one factory? Do you think they're, you know, flexing a few different factories to handle that demand. What do you think that looks like from a supply chain perspective? Yeah, strategically, it's not a bad idea to have all of your factories qualified uh, to produce a similar type of product. Uh, it looks like what they're doing is they are probably sourcing it out, and then they've got one factory doing the, the Coach Prime deal. Um, just looking through the website, it, it looked there were some very similar looking sunglasses on a couple of these that looked to be kind of where they were getting it from. Yeah, it makes sense. Makes sense. And then in terms of their fulfillment, I mean, what does that look like, right? Because on one hand, you have a brand that's growing like crazy that also has a bit of a retail presence. And then on the other hand, you also need a fulfillment center that can flex when, you know, all of a sudden you do 100,000 orders in a week. Unexpectedly, you know, you need the right back end fulfillment partner to handle that. What does that fulfillment base look like? Yeah, so really interesting. There, there's some unique things that popped up when we were looking at the supply chain. So it appears that they partnered initially with Saddle Creek Logistics, uh, at least for the first few years, uh, but have since 2022 shifted over to PFS. And PFS is an interesting uh, provider, originally from Texas, had about 11 locations, uh, but they were acquired by GXO in 2023, in October. Um, it, you know, we were talking about Ship Bob earlier for $4 billion. Uh, PFS was acquired for 181 million, so a little bit different there. Uh, but GXO, good company, trying to do their their roll up strategy here. Um, but their, their main interest in the PFS deal was they wanted to get into these higher growth verticals like cosmetics and fashion. And I think part of this was a bit of a reaction because in 2021, 2022, Ryder, who's one of their biggest competitors in the space, acquired Whiplash for $480 million some dollars. And so I, I kind of bring all this up because, uh, one, there's some interesting commentary just around what's going on as far as consolidations in the fulfillment uh, ecosystem. But also, whenever there is a change in ownership at a fulfillment center, it typically, it, it's one that you really have to pay attention. I'm not saying that things are slowing down or not doing well, but it's, it, there's certainly a change there. And so I would be curious to know how Blenders feels about the PFS relationship since the acquisition, uh, since it really just happened uh, less than six months ago. And, you know, I, I've heard stories of new ownership coming in, the operators, the folks that knew your business, who knew what was going on, they leave, they get their payday. Uh, and then you, you kind of have new folks that are coming in, new ideas, they want to change things. And so I personally prefer not to go to a fulfillment center if I can help it, if there's been a change in ownership in the last 12 to 18 months. Um, Obviously, they're here, and so it's a big deal to move a 3PL. 
um, but I'm sure that the that the GXO team is is paying special attention to make sure they're they're keeping a, a company like Blenders happy. Totally. I mean, especially with that kind of pass through relationship with the Safilo Group, which is you know a huge eyewear conglomerate. It's got to be a super important relationship for GXO. So I'm sure they're keeping a close eye on them. Unlike uh, you know, if if you're a small brand at, at Ship Bob, it's it's a lot different here. That's for sure. And especially you know, I think you need this scaled up fulfillment center that has you know 11 fulfillment locations across the country in order to handle that that demand i mean i'm i'm estimating you know i I don't have any you know insight information here in regards to how blenders manages its inventory at these fulfillment centers but i would estimate that they you know utilize at least two maybe even three fulfillment centers for you know east coast and west coast just to you know lower their their shipping costs uh to their customers because you know, most of their volume is still through their website directly. Yeah, interesting enough, when I can tell that they're just using a single fulfillment center in Memphis, uh, which you you put in Memphis because of FedEx. And so if you're going to have a single location, uh, Memphis is a good location. So is Cincinnati or Louisville, just with kind of where the major hubs are. And so, you know, they're probably looking at something where they are leveraging the the next day or, you know, two-day network um, and then using SurePost for, slower deals and things like that makes sense makes sense i wanted to go back a little bit nathan and pick your thoughts on the factory so even though they are not single sourcing from a specific factory they are single sourcing from a particular country do you do you see that there's risk in that or is there something that um you you would recommend people look at and keep going Yeah, I mean, I think um, it's a good question. You know, I think obviously there's inherent risks of being single sourced in China, especially right now, given the political climate. And, you know, we've seen changes in tariffs. We've seen big changes in the relationships between America and China over the past, you know, five years. But I think, you know, there are other options. So I am a bit surprised they don't have, you know, options in Mexico or, you know, other parts of Southeast Asia. I think Mexico would, would be a no, no, you know, no-brainer for them. I mean, at Sourceify, you know, I know we've done sunglasses in probably three or four different countries. And so, you know, though China is probably the most efficient way for the most part to produce sunglasses, you know, at this scale, it does make sense to look at options outside of China. So, I mean, you know, if I were the head of supply chain, I would definitely look for a resource and work with a resource in Mexico and possibly somewhere else in, in Asia as well. Um, but I think especially when they're flexing order volume that, that, that quickly, you know, having a resource in Mexico would be amazing from a logistics perspective just to, you know, get product over. I mean, fortunately, sunglasses are lightweight, and so the air freight is not, you know, crazy expensive. But at, at the same time, I mean, you know, they would be able to avoid air freight when they have a big spike working with, a big creator or celebrity like Coach Prime, that would make a lot of sense to be able to flex some resources in Mexico from that that angle. That makes sense. I think too, you know, you look at other countries that have free trade agreements with the U.S. and even though it may be a little bit more expensive coming out of uh, coming out of Mauritius or India directly, once you add in the tariffs, you add in some some transit costs, it can be pretty competitive. So it's it's an interesting piece there, and it'll be. It'll be interesting to see if the Blenders team decides to add in some geographic diversity there. Yeah, we'll have to keep a pulse on this. It's a really good question. And yeah, to me, because they have such spikes in orders with these partnerships, you know, it's so hard to forecast when you work with a, a creator or celebrity like that, that it makes a lot of sense to have something, you know, closer uh, that they could they could flex more efficiently. 